Chips matchup to, of, of the day, but we are not done yet as we still have the climb out of the Crucible with Gale Force Esports and No Tomorrow. I'm Dreadnought. As always, up here is going to be Jay Howe with me. And Jay Howe, this matchup, I think, is going to be a bit more competitive than the last one. LFM, Team Freedom, a bit, you know, kind of David and Goliath, but not quite the case with No Tomorrow and GFE. They're pretty similar in terms of. I guess aggression in terms of the way they like to do it. It's really funny because Gale Force, they average a lot of kills a game, but they average some of the least average hero damage. It's really weird. It's like, look, we're one shot, one kill. They've done it a lot with Jaina. We've seen some Kerrigan games. And no tomorrow on the other side, they are probably the most aggressive team that we have, maybe outside of a Tempo Storm death ball comp. So this is like when firecrackers go off, fireworks go off, this is probably the series where you're gonna see it happen. Yeah, and we're gonna, you know, bring up not only the standings to look at what happened in the last series, but what is on the line here for these two teams, uh, because a lot of it's gonna fall with the standings, mainly talking about Gale Force there at the fifth slot and No Tomorrow, which is falling under that crucible range. It is very crucial, you know, that No Tomorrow ends up getting this win over Gale Force to pull themselves out of it. But I mean, it really is, you know, if, they, if Gale Force ends up dropping this, it's one of those things that this loss could put them in that kind of path in the area to kind of fall into that threat range, and you know they want to be avoiding that at all costs. And what I mentioned at the start of the broadcast for No Tomorrow, because they haven't won a lot of games, right? Obviously, they haven't won a lot of series, but they haven't won a lot of games either. And oftentimes, if you do have the record there, then oftentimes it comes down to who has the most games, that plus minus in terms of wins versus losses. So if you're No Tomorrow, not only do you want to win this series and then hope that Gale Force potentially loses more while you pick up more wins, but you also need to be picking up the 3-0, 3-1, something like that to start to inch ahead in those numbers and maybe neutralize that. So for No Tomorrow, it's multiple multiple layers in terms of, I think, how they want to perform. Yeah, multiple ways to, ways to find their way out of that crucible range that we were talking about. But, you know, Equinox and Mike Udall, they used to be old teammates, and we decided that they would be the members that we ended up sitting down and hearing their thoughts about this matchup. So I think the No Tomorrow match, like, that's a really important one for us to, like, stay out of the crucible. I know B Kid always jokes, you know, he's going for that back to back to back, but I really don't want to play a Crucible. So uh, beating them, my former teammate Equinox, is always a lot of fun. I mean, the thing about No Tomorrow is that it's the Equinox factor, man. Every team he has been on, which every single one, they always, sometime throughout the season, upset someone. Like I, I don't know what it is. So I, I really hope we don't see the, the we're gonna we're gonna upset you Equinox, uh, is what I like to call it. Uh, I, I really hope that's not the the no tomorrow they show up uh, against our match. But even if they do, I, I still think we have a pretty good shot if we just show up and play our best. But I swear that team, man, every single split. I, I know they've upset us at least once last year. Uh, let's hope they don't do it once this year. Series versus Go Force is definitely one of our more important series. They're a lot more reliant on team fights than they used to be than their macro, so I think that's just what we'll have to watch out for. They've been loving Jaina, they've been loving heroes like that. We need to beat them and anyone below the top three to secure like us out of Crucible. As long as we focus on those matches the most, we'll be okay, because that's like the most important thing, is obviously just not going to Crucible, because you know, no one likes, wants to get relegated. Again, no tomorrow we'll be playing with Jin, a newer adjustment for this roster since some of the changes that have come in from them as a squad looking at part number two. And that is something that I guarantee Gale Force Esports is also kind of putting onto that layer of confidence that they are going to have going into the series. But I feel like not only because of the standings and where these teams have ended up performing so far in North America, the reason I feel like it's going to be that much more competitive is a lot of what we heard from Mikey Dahl. Equinox team... They never, they never seem to go down 0-3, number one, whenever he's on a roster, and they always end up getting that miracle upset against somebody. I feel like this is that kind of right in that range, right in that time frame where we can expect that upset from them. Well, he said the Equinox factor. One thing to factor in, obviously, with Jen coming in, he is now going to be on that main tank role, which means Equinox can slide over just a little bit onto that melee role, either be in the off tank or 
the melee assassin. And Sonya comes to mind, things like that, whether you know you consider her an assassin or not. But I think this is an area where if you're going to see No Tomorrow take that step, this plays directly into the hands of the way Equinox likes to play. He's never been a big fan of playing that tank role. He just kind of assumed it at, on, a, on a much necessary, a much needed basis. And I think this is the situation where no Tomorrow might be able to shine a little bit. Yeah, Equinox kind of became a warrior out of the necessity for the roster way, way, way back. And then, you know, he's been, but originally playing on those kind of melee assassins, those playmakers, and it's going to be see, it's going to be cool to see where they end up bringing that out here because it's, the battleground is going to change a lot towards where, you know, what heroes are viable on that assassin role versus not on the side of Equinox. So looking at the battleground pool for the first series here today, or the first game of today between these teams, No Tomorrow is going to, in fact, select Infernal Shrines. Gale Force ended up getting the ban onto Battlefield of Eternity, and Voskaya was removed there by No Tomorrow. Not too interesting of a choice from them. Still sitting at some of the higher priority from them, and, it, and it's not like it stands too much out for Gale Force. Also provides a lot of those melee assassins we were kind of talking about, which ones we'll end up getting. Probably the Kerrigan, maybe the <laughs> Kerrigan. Uh, that's the first thing you got to be thinking about whenever Equinox comes to your mind. Again, I'm pretty sure for the longest time, his bio on Twitter, if you go check him out, still says something about, I like Kerrigan or something along those lines. Still has that love for, for Kerrigan. I think he even didn't he have like a Kerrigan profile pic for a while. I, 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 that might be a little maybe bit the too banner far, but or something, something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, it's just never been a miss there from No Tomorrow. This is the map. Uh, it's Infernal Shrines, maybe Tomb of the Spider Queen. You mix in there, but obviously Infernal, kind of the traditional. The D band out still for Gale Force Esports, even from the first pick slot. Interesting choice from them. Going to go with the first pick, Maev, though. Not the case and priority that we saw at all out of our first series in North America here. Interesting. I'm, I I, I want to say I feel like this is too high. We'll find out. There's an early Sonya Dreadnought. I mean, that is something. Now, last week, Maev was first pick, I want to say, and this is between Europe, North America, and Korea. I want to say it was, hold on, I'll tell you in one second. She was 8-13 and 13 overall last week. And when it came to first pick potential, it was pretty abysmal in terms of that win rate. So it's a little bit surprising, obviously, especially post nerfs with Maev. But I guess if you can kind of chain those auto attacks, get those tethers in and around the shrine, we'll see how effective that can be. Heroes like Sonya want to be in that melee range. So if you're Gale Force, you have to find some way to get minor interrupts, whether you end up going down a really safe Johanna route, you've got to find something or an Uther if you're trying to get a stun. I think there's definitely something you've got to do more other than just pulling in the Sonya, who is just going to walk right along with you if you get that tell. Like, thank you for the gap closer. <laughs> I will take this for free. It is very appreciated. There's the Malfurion. Bit of a higher Tychus than we normally see coming in before the second ban phase, but I feel like he's one of the few kind of well-rounded generic picks that you can pick in this current meta to... That doesn't really give away too much in any direction of your composition if you aren't confident and don't want to commit in any area, but aren't going to regret the fact that you selected it later on. So I feel like it's a bit of a blank decision there for Gale Force. The thing about it is, is Maev was Michael Udall last week, and Tychus is going to be Biggie. So your back line is pretty much already taken care of. So no tomorrow. That's a lot showing in the first three picks here on the side of Gale Force. So you know what type of range, although obviously Maev being the melee, unless they're making some type of big change with B-Kid. So now you strictly have to focus on the potential front line. You can see they started that with the Diablo pick, maybe have a big front line pick of their own. And it just kind of makes me wonder, well, Gale Force, depending on what's available, we've seen a lot of Tyrael and a lot of ETC for Fury. Obviously, those are his two highest win rate heroes, his two most effective heroes. The Tyrael's banned out. They might be assuming they can get the ETC. Yeah, I think that might be too bold of a statement, though. No Tomorrow can easily pick up the ETC for themselves here if they would like. They're not going to do so. Instead, move into a Hanzo Johanna. The Hanzo is not the part that seems that curious. It's mainly just the Sonya. There is not, I mean, I, or, or, or excuse me, Johanna. It's just mainly the... Uh, 
I was going to say the lack of, you know, kind of frontliner to synergize with that Sonya and what threat that provides over the shrine control. I guess you can make the argument this is because we see the Maiev, you want to have the Iron Skin, have some kind of threat. But with so much focus on those frontliners and the Sonya spin, you were worried about that, right? Like the Maiev tether and how is that going to impact pack it? Every other stun warrior that is easily threatening Sonya has been banned out as long as you end up picking up uh, the Garrosh for yourself in this rotation to the point where I felt like that has got to be the go-to here for No Tomorrow. So instead, relying on the synergy, putting a lot more on the pressure of Hanzo. And we'll see, you know, if the JoJo is going to be enough here for the Maiev and the threat that she provides. Well, you just talked about the pressure of the Hanzo, but if you guys missed last game, we were talking back and forth, and Dreadnought was making a point about the build that we saw from Hanzo on Volskaya going into the explosive arrow at four, although we're going to see the Garrosh. So we see the Garrosh on the front line with the mouth L being picked up. The explosive arrow, but then the armor reduction at level seven. And I think that build definitely suits this battleground in particular. So, you know, obviously that's going to have a major impact in terms of the Garrosh now being on that front line who relies strictly on having that armor for survivability. Last pick up, pick up there is the Tassadar for No Tomorrow with this composition. One of the cases where I actually really enjoyed the Tassadar, not only because it's into the mail tail on the other side, a fear of a lot of the threat within Garrosh and Maiev, not going to be too controlled by that. Synergizes and makes up for the lack of supporting that maybe Stukov is going to struggle with in this type of composition, does well with that Sony kill potential. All around, it's one of the, you know, more calculated, I feel like, Tassadars that we've gotten to see as of late out in North America. Well, now you can easily go into that redemption at level one potentially the extra life steal at level four for Tassadar, and then that way you can kind of double up and uh, again apply that synergy there. Uh, I'm trying to look at reasons why you might go armor and there's not a whole lot there that you might need that extra armor. I mean, sometimes we've seen teams go into that movement speed, but all around, I absolutely love No Tomorrow's draft here. I do enjoy the draft. I just feel like Guild Force Esports I don't know. I, 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 I'm I stuck on my F, right? It's going to be, is this worth the first pick? I agree with you. Right now, my brain, everything leads towards no, no tomorrow right now. But it's just, is that my F still going to be worth it? Gale Force Esports with the bold move, now going to be looking up to put up the numbers to back it up. Well, as we get this series started, it is going to be no tomorrow on the left here in blue. As it's going to be Casanova on the Tassadar, which means Shrite is going to be on Hanzo, Tomster on the Stukov, Jen on Johanna, and Equinox on the Sonya. And in red is Gale Force Esports, where we have big impact on Tychus. Mike Udall playing that Maiev. B-Kid repping the front on Malthale. Fury, as always, on his Garrosh, and Akafe supporting the team with Malfurion. I think during the break, I wanna, I'm going to take a look at Garrosh's win rate on Infernal Shrines. I'm, I think Garrosh, obviously, his win rate across the board has gone up a lot. He, I think, rose about nine percentage points just in this past weekend in terms of where his success lied. He's actually the highest win rate warrior that we have after being more towards that mid, maybe towards bottom tier, has all of a sudden risen up to the top. And Michael Udall pulling in multiple members of No Tomorrow. Yeah, No Tomorrow is now trying to get the retreat. Tom's are unable to do so. Nice knock back there into a root. Gale Force Esports claimed two for nothing over that first minion wave. Very nice start from them and something that we can expect them to keep up this level of aggression. That's a window of opportunity you normally don't get this early, especially on a map like Shrines. Well, we wondered where my F would fit, and that's a pretty good start if you're on the side of Gale Force getting the lockdown. And, you know, we're not seeing Redemption. We're not seeing the Scatter Arrow build. Instead, we're seeing Target Practice, which, Dread, that requires you to hit your, your Q, your Stormbow, on every hero. And on Infernal Shrines, I feel like it's a bit more difficult. Yes. Uh, I, I, I would say uh, it n it's not only because the minions and the difficulty to be able to get in other areas, but then it also comes off as, I think the biggest question mark here is not the adjustment in the build, but this is a adjustment in the build not into armor shred, into a Garrosh trade, right? So now that that is very, very different than almost every interaction that we've seen with the Garrosh. So I I'll be honest, I remain overly skeptical, but you know, Jay Street Day has been known to mix it up with some of his builds here in North America, so I just a bit. <laughs> I'm just I'm just ready to be pleasantly surprised. That's where I always leave it. Whenever we see these kind of builds that that kind of breaks my mold here of what I've come to learn. I just, you know, there's got to be a reason for it here. You know, tomorrow going to get the invade. They're coming in, but Fury, he should be able to get the toss off the minute he gets out of that silence, gets the toss, gets the groundbreaker up, but Jen still holding point. He's got to go because the rest of the members there, while he gets out of there, Shrite and Tomster go down, and 
Gale Force is coming out hot right now. Yeah, and it's normally not in a type of draft where you'd be like, this is the aggressive composition, right? Garrosh, Maev, yes, they're pretty good. Malfurion there with the follow-up, but Tychus is normally a, a backliner that you go maybe good for one kill, right? Uh, this is now the second initiation in a row where they double down with those picks, cut it off, gain a lot onto the map, and Gale Force, if they keep this up, I said I think the series is going to be a lot more competitive than the last, but... At this pacing, it's going to be less so. They are just really bringing it here to know tomorrow. Six to five, ten seconds away from the Shrine activating. You can also see both teams have split off to those Shaman camps, which they'll push off in that top lane. It looks like Gale Force should be able to get an early start here. You know, obviously when it comes to the wave clear, Tassadar Sonia do really well on the Shrine. Stukov can obviously zone out quite a bit. But Gale Force not too shabby their own when you add a Tychus into the mix. I'm going to be really keeping my eyes on now that you brought up Jay Shrita's build is just how often, like that for instance, right? That normally would be providing attemptive, you know, shred opportunity. Pretty even so far in the Shrine race as both of them kind of go back and forth. The teeter totter here. The race is definitely going to be here. Neither team being overly aggressive, but Jen walking in. There's the aggressive lurking arm is split the members of Gale Force. They've got to get Tomster lifted up, and Fury does just that as the race continues, Trent. Nice condemn there coming out from Johanna. Pulled back Gale Force for a moment. Seven's going to be picked up from them. Still no talents here available. There goes the three-man tether. The Malfurion route locking all of No Tomorrow down. Nice lurking arm attempt for a moment there, but No Tomorrow is losing three members for nothing here on the side of GFE. Mike even going down. Looking for a tether number two onto Jay Shrita, gets it. Fury not in range for that groundbreaker. Comes the cost of a Punisher, but I've got to say there's a fat worth here coming out from Gale Force after that fight. Uh, I'd say that's pretty worth as they've extended their lead. They won't give up a whole lot here. Maybe one turret, maybe not any turrets. It's, it's like, uh, wait a minute, Hanzo. Oh, Got get him the, with that B step. See, that's the, okay. That's the delay right there. As Michael's like, look, I know I'm gonna be on camera, but I gotta make sure that in case they're a little bit late, I'm definitely on camera. So there's a little bit of extra B stepping there, and see if he can B step his way out he to safety. He got to dodge on the slow. Oh my. And he's gonna be fine. Not a worry in the world here from Mike Udall. Even got the flashy style points there on the way out. Everything's right. looking good for them, and that's a lot of style to be working with, is it looks like at this pace, Dreadnought, Gale Force should be able to get 10 by the time the next Shrine phase comes up, and I don't know if No Tomorrow's gonna have that opportunity. They might be having to give up the next Punisher. They end up having to give up the next Punisher. I mean, that is a lot more than just that, right? It's how many force they can get with that time frame, like in that window, so much so that they feel like they have to force. They're gonna look for the invade here. They're gonna be it. given it. I mean, you called the force, and they walked right in. And I think Gale Force is like, look, we've got such a big lead that we can give it up. I mean, obviously, it's a safe play. Malthiel still in that top lane, soaking up. And the threat of 10 is looming here. Is Gale Force about a quarter of a level away, just under half? They find themselves Equinox to see if we get the tether. Tether there, Mikey Doll. You know, it's like going fishing. You just reel them right back in. But that was actually really well done in the sense that he could have tethered much sooner. Yeah. But he literally delayed it, delayed it, delayed it. He saw the Equinox came back in. If you tether too soon, you don't get the same value. Got the stall and the timing there. It's enough to get him a kill. Probably not going to be the last. Is Tomster caught out down on bottom. Gale Force Esports 10 to 0 in kills in this game right now, Jay Howe. It is just an absolute bloodbath here. And it's only no tomorrow that is sacrificing to the squad. <laughs> this, oh man, I don't want to jinx anything, but last weekend they came out hot too against Heroes Hearth, went up 2-0. Uh, He's bringing it up already here. We haven't even finished game one. He's just bringing back the horror stories well, you of Gale know. Force in week one. <laughs> I don't want to get too excited. I mean, this is the Gale Force you expect to see and hope to see. Uh, as this Shrine phase actually had a very long time period between uh, activation and where No Tomorrow is actually going to be at even talent tiers now. It's going to be good for them. It's just how much do they, you know, commit to this Shrine is the next thing we got to be focusing on. Shrine, or excuse me, Shaman Camp spawning. Gale Force is going to be attending to theirs. 
The Dragon Hungers was picked up, by the way, for Shrite on Hanzo, which whenever he lands that Stormbow, he gets extra spell power for 10 seconds, and that can stack up. So obviously he's still trying to make sure going fully into the Stormbow build. Again, a unique build, to say the least. Yeah, not very common. Puts a lot on to, a lot of pressure onto him, a lot so a lot less onto again killing the front line, but damage output is in theory higher with perfect play. So he throws out that Stormbow there, getting a bit of damage onto Tychus. Nine to ten when it comes to these skeletal defenders. Jin taking a bit of damage. There he goes the tether, pulls him back, lurking arm thrown down. Odin using the shrub. Got a party here for you, no tomorrow, says big impact. Gonna push them away for a moment. Equinox poking around with that poison spear. Equinox getting thrown back in and taunted, but the storm arrow is going in. So the dragon zero came in with that stun, but it wasn't enough to save the likes of Equinox. Now Jin under pressure. He uses the bless shield in return, trying to retreat to safety. As you can see, the groundbreaker is gonna lock him in. That's gonna be Jin going down as well. Very good job here for Gale Force Esports now with 12 to 0 in terms of those kills. Massive shove comes out. Fury is 24 seconds out from that taunt. Punisher backing. Shaman Camp still pressuring top. 13 talent tier achieved. There is literally nothing going wrong for Gale Force in this game whatsoever. 12 kills in just under nine minutes is, is looking pretty good. You know, they'll have this advantage here to see how aggressive they want to be. All members of No Tomorrow are up. Sonya was forced to go to the top, so this is going to be a five versus four. They're good, looking for that sidewall. Fury's going to look for an opportunity. The minute this Punisher jumps, they might try and move in. They're taking a little bit of damage, though. It's Casanova returning some of that with a Psy Storm on Tassadar, which did complete his quest, getting that extra damage. Punisher baited over the wall from Jin. Force out the iron skin. Mikey Doll is like, ooh, baby, I know that's a tether. Tries to get one, pulls it back. Passive there from B-Kid. The root thrown down from Akaface. Dragon Arrow Force from Jay Shrite. Tranquility even used. B-Kid gets the Punisher for that all you bleep in. Keeps himself alive. Jin now with a four-man condemn. Look at Gale Force. They want to get out of this. They realize they found themselves in a bad spot. Equinox falls low. Gets the damage there from B-Kid. Ends up getting a kill. Massive shove now onto Mikey Doll, forcing the vault. B-Kid taking the keep shots, but with minions approaching and Odin still out, this is going to be first keep of the game at 10 minutes in. You know, things got a little bit hairy there, but Gale Force still walks out unscathed. That was very impressive from Gale Force Esports. Not so much what they were able to make happen with the objective, with the advantages, but the starting an initiation and not working optimally with that much pressure and that many, you know, opportunities to get the turnaround from no tomorrow, Still holding their own, still coming out on top, and then not letting anything get wild beyond that, again, kind of hairy moment for only a second there. That takes a lot of control and calculation from a team, and probably a large reason why Gale Force here is rounding a almost full talent tier advantage. It's not going to be quite the case, but the fact that they're even this close against No Tomorrow feels like night and day here from them over last week. But again, consistency seems to be a problem from Gale Force Esports. And we've, we've, we could say the we've, same thing about No Tomorrow because they could just as easily come back next game and go full stop. Hold on a second, Dread. Blessed Shield Condemn forces the Warden's Cage three man tether into it. Nice job trying to all escape the same route. Jay Shrite will end up making himself out of there, but Fury is not going to allow Tom Sir to do the same. Nice throw back there. Ends up getting the first kill. Now Mikey Dahl flanking up above. Not going to go in for any tether threat yet. Putting on a clinic. I mean, 14 kills to zero, and it doesn't look like they have any any signs of letting up. They're just pushing through, starting to take structure damage. Fury eating a few of those shots, but now minions are here. He's going to be able to forego those as Biggie trying to put the the damage onto the fort. Casanova, you could see he was shielding the fort, but it's not going to be enough. I mean, they are just doing whatever they want with no tomorrow. No tomorrow's got to find a way to stop the bleeding. It's ideally, I know this sounds crazy. I feel like it's got to be the 16 into what I'm assuming to be 19 fight. It realistically seems like the only one. They might be giving up too much structurally in that downtime. If not, it's going to be under their keeps as Gale Force keep trying to force the hand. This next Punisher, no 16 talents here, will be within that time frame, unless, again, Gale Force somehow overextends here. Sonya showing herself on bottom, too, show that it's a pretty easy clear. Gale Force 
like last game, going to back out and take the easier route. Instead, Malthale starting over the second Shaman camp, time it with the Punisher, and then get that double threat. This should allow, this is one of those moments where I'm gonna ask the Sea Gale Force, there's gonna be a time frame where somebody has to answer to top four, the Punisher's given up for free, and in that window, I wanna see everybody else on Gale Force taking out mid keep from wall as hard as they can, because they are prepping themselves for lethal at this point in time. And if not, prepping themselves for the skirmish that No Tomorrow is going to move up for. 17 to 14 down a talent tier in three levels. It looks like No Tomorrow is going to work their way in. They've got to be careful. This could be, if this falls against them, obviously we're not just looking at another Punisher, but potentially game. Gale Force holding their own right now, has the Skeletal Defender lead. Jen and Equinox on the front line. You see the lurking arm go down, but Michael Udall comes in with the Warden's Cage, but he gets shoved away. Yeah, Odin, though, doing a lot of work in that choke. Fury's going to go ahead and throw down the Warlord's Challenge, bringing two back. Dragon Arrow goes in, but the damage onto Stukov's enough to get the first kill. Last right is going to claim the second there on to Jin. Equinox getting that Whirlwind, keeping himself alive, but not for long. Three members down. Gale Force Esports cleaning house cleaning shop once again even tracking down casanova with no dimensional shift four for zero 18 to zero and kills punisher here shaman camp sieging up on top it's almost like we've seen this once before a punisher being achieved as they get the wipe and a shaman split pushing elsewhere gale force is just on a tear right now biggie getting that rundown with that level one talent he did finish that quest you get that extra movement speed after you use that running gun now they did make their way forward. The keep wall prepped and fall in there. Biggie taking down the well, making sure he stays out of keep range. Punisher being baited over, but it's not going very far. The keep's going down. Fury looking for another pick. If he gets a flip back, it's all but game. Right now the Punisher sitting about 50% health. No tomorrow, holding on for dear life. Punisher leap coming off cooldown soon. Warlord challenge goes in. There goes the leap. First kill already there before the last race can even get the value. Jin now trying to get the retreat. Iron skin has to be forced. Gale Force now move on to the core. Shielding is going to be dropping. 10% still left onto this Punisher. Tranquility is there to seal the deal. Game one is going over to Gale Force Esports in a flat shutout. 19 to zero. 19 to zero. Gale Force, give me this every game, like even if it's like nine to zero, you're, you gotta be satisfied when you, when you make it 19. And suddenly, you know, I, we started out and we we're like, no tomorrow's draft, it feels like it should be able to hold its own. But I almost feel like we could erase, like I wish we could erase yeah, that. Yeah, just from history. <laughs> well, okay, well, let's, let's bring to light, like why, why do you say that, right? And then how can you have a shutout game in that manner? Well, first of all, the starting out with level one initiation, the fact that it's two kills into the Maiev composition, then looking over the next Punisher, like both of those double kills were literally timed with a camp at a different point in the map, except for the level one one, which is giving you a, the biggest window of opportunity during the debatably one of the most important mini waves in the game, right? Like how you get those rotations around level one. It just, every kill they got, they were getting more than one at one time. They're getting them timed like near optimally. And then no tomorrow just hit a moment where it's like, we have two all in fights that we might be able to get. Can we make it happen? And Gale Force was just, nah, every single time. <laughs> that bottom keep was the best fight no tomorrow was gonna get the whole game and was unable to take it. Michael Udall on my ev. Highly questioned that first pick. Everything that I saw from Europe, just looking at the patch notes in general, I'm like, there's no way my Ev's going to have the same priority. Gil Force comes right out. They first pick it. Is it the opponent? Is it the draft? Is it the battleground that kind of made it work? It doesn't matter because Michael Udall is like, I'm going to make it work in every circumstance. And he did. And that was kind of what was a little bit surprising to see that they just came out so strong and they put on a show, I mean, in every form or fashion. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing to highlight, too, uh, is just that we we start that and we look at the draft, but then it's like, we are yet to see Maiev being played. It's like, is that worth the pickup, right? And it's just like, I kind of left it up to them. I was like, I want to see, you know, this first pick Maiev at least do work. I mean, it's very obvious that he did a <laughs> lot of it that game and, you know, very quickly made it go like, ooh, maybe we should be second guessing where Maiev does end up falling. I will say, I feel like, Maiev is oftentimes going to be a hero that looks like when she's winning, she's winning extremely hard because you can't walk away from those skirmishes once she forces them, right, uh, into even footing, much like Zeratul. Is if you already win the fight, he can, like, oh, uh, would you like more kills? Yeah, here they are. And so because that, I think that aided to a little bit, but the, what he had happen in the laning phase and how much of an impact those tether had, it's going to be scary, uh, you know, kind of for no tomorrow, looking towards game number two. Talking about game two, we're going to be figuring out where this battleground is. After that victory from Gale Force, No Tomorrow goes with the first pick, and Gale Force now going to take us to Cursed Hollow. 
It's a favorite map here for Gale Force, one of the few teams that, you know, really enjoy sticking to it, but it's not like it's a low priority for No Tomorrow either. It's one of their highest priority too, so this is one of those, like last series, we're saying overlap, who ends up picking those maps? Usually it's the team that's confident, right? The one that is considers themselves a better team that will end up selecting it. So Gale Force showing confidence in game one in play, displaying it here in map selection for game two. This brings up a completely different meta, and I think outside of both of these teams, especially combined with both of these teams, you might look at something a little bit more standard, but now you have to really consider the Abather pick. And the Equinox factor, we saw the Sonya that game, might even be able to consider the Illidan on this map if you really want to shake things up, if you really think that's where your strengths lie. This is actually the team, although they don't have Jason anymore, this is the team that ran a Lost Vikings composition. Jason was that Lost Vikings player and a really good one. They had a very unique strategy and I think they won in something like seven or eight minutes, maybe, maybe nine. It was a very short game. So they have tricks up their sleeve. We'll see if any of those come out here. They aren't the only team that is known, you know, of old to bring out the Vikings once hey. in a while. Gale Force is a squad that's How comfortable that? doing that. <laughs> I I will say this. I I would be very happy if we do not get a Vikings. I, I not a huge fan of the place. You, you should say that midway through the